what the share yeah share screen uh, that should be oh before everything did you uh did you download the syllabus i just uploaded syllabus earlier this morning because i just finished it uh quite haphazardly so um you could go to a website a link there oh no that's my yeah you could go to that link to download it and obviously you can go to the Moodle to download it whichever way you you like um that kind of sucks yeah it says it says Stanley Kubrick's 2001 and then I put complete there just wanting to uh cover it up because it is complete 2001 so I just, just trying to make a joke uh I could have put this film as your required viewing for this week, but since only three of you, or I think it was four, only four of you have actually seen the film that I said as required viewing, so it was a bit disappointing. Uh, but no matter, you could watch it afterwards. It's it's not really that relevant, but it's 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 kind of quirky. Um, like I said, it's left field. Uh, did you all receive my message? I send uh, through Moodle. Okay, so everything works um okay what should i do here yeah. i should probably open up the syllabus as well um that's very that's very large um okay yeah this isn't really my computer so i don't really know how to work anything right so that's me obviously this is me otherwise i wouldn't be standing here i know i know i look like a student but uh yeah this i am the instructor um i'm not technically a lecturer here although i i sort of am but my main job here is uh is still a ta because i haven't got the the experience required well not the experience because tech, uh, the number one thing you have to you have to have to be a a proper professor would be to have published which i kind of haven't so i'm still working on that um so my proper job here is the ta but then uh, every now and then or well, every year very fortunately they give me uh you know these lecturing gigs for me for the extra salary um that i so desperately need um so layer is my name i know it's uh very weird sounding uh it's it looks like a girl's name which it i mean it could be depending on which culture you're looking in you are looking at it in um i'm part japanese so the name is japanese although it's spelled slightly differently than the japanese because they don't use the l they use the r uh my mom told me the story um so she was lying in bed in the hospital she was looking at the tiles on the ceiling and then she was like testing out all the names on the squares on the ceiling and then she landed on this not realizing that this sounds uh, very close to a certain princess character in a certain Star Wars uh, franchise. So, in case you have a, you have problems, you have difficulty pronouncing my name. That's your cue. You just think of the princess. Of course, I'm not a princess, but uh, you know, whichever way you prefer. Um, so that's me. Um, I have a PhD. Obviously, otherwise, I wouldn't be here to be the uh the lecturer here uh to get a PhD I don't know whether you guys know this or not because you're so early into your academic careers or whatever but in order to get a PhD you need to have an, an original research and you have to sort of write a book the, the PhD thesis itself is like a book I wrote like a hundred thousand words on it I could have published it as a book and then then I would have published then I could probably land a, a, a professor an assistant professor job somewhere but I was too lazy to do that no time no energy whatever so I didn't do that but that thesis that I did was not on narrative but uh, I, I did this on um, so my PhD was in film uh, I did film studies and uh, my interest uh, was still is in uh, time travel so like time machines uh, traveling through time, hence the film choice that I picked for those for the four of you who saw that film. Um, it's uh, very much about time travel. It kind of it isn't because there's no time travel depicted in the film, which is kind of why it's so interesting as an example. Um, 
So it is one way of looking at narrative. So I am, so I suppose you can say that I do know my stuff in this. Uh, I do try to adapt some of my uh, research in one of the weeks. If you scroll down there, you see uh, you see my stupid little name there in one of the weeks. Yeah, there you go. So I decided to uh, I actually debated on this for quite a while, but then yeah. I was I was like screw it let's let's just make this public let's just uh, let you guys see you know what kind what kind of embarrassing thing I wrote back then in uh, 2017 to get me uh, the, the PhD so it's it's only one of the chapters though so it's not the whole thing. Um, what else do I have to say? Right, so you realize I am uh, talking about stories, right? I told you about the stories. Uh, about how my mom came up with my name, I could explain the hat as well. It's not it's not fashion. This is uh, this is half necessary because I had a I had a car crash a few months ago in March. Uh, I left a scar in, uh, in the back of my head, and uh, I suppose you can call it a cosmetic reason because it's it's not really it's not really there anymore. But I I just I just thought it's a it's a good idea to wear a hat to sort of cover it. To, so it's not really fashion, but kind of fashion in a way. Right, so I keep telling my stories, which is sort of irritating, but I think in this context, in a course about narratives, I think it's kind of relevant because have you seen that advert on YouTube, that uh, masterclass advert? You have the uh, uh, negotiator. You have that blur come out and say, I'm a negotiator. You, you're you probably uh, you know, three to seven. I don't know how he, he comes up with that specific number. You're probably three to seven negotiations each day. Getting your coffee at Starbucks is a negotiation. Do you, have you seen that advert? Do I have to, do I have to play it? Um, I don't think that's true. I don't think negoti- I don't think you come across negotiations that many times every day, but you do come across narratives every day because every time you, you have to explain something, you have to explain, you have to put it in a narrative, right? I explain my name, I put it in a narrative. I explain the hat, I put it in a narrative. Um, that brings me to, I suppose, a question. What do you know about narrative, right? I keep using this word, narrative. Um, let's have a little bit of a brainstorm. When, when you think of narrative, what sort of words or ideas well, let's put it this way. Uh, like a, a child comes up to you and asks you, "What is narrative? What would you, what would you have said to them?" Just shout any words, anything. Narrative. What is narrative? Good. Yeah, you, that's usually the first one people would go to. Story. What else? Okay. Good. Yeah, I like it. Description. Sorry, what what in time? Ah, okay. So you, yeah, yeah, okay. So you have already uh, gone to the really advanced sort of explanations of narrative. Okay, yeah, I like I like those things. Um, yeah, I would go with uh, things like versions, uh, rhetoric, um, interpretation. Hence, this uh, Susan Sontag reading that I sort of assigned as a required viewing, not viewing, reading. Um, because when you describe a narrative and you when you when you tell a story, there's always a a point of view, right? Your way of telling a story is different from, uh, you know, another person's point of view. Case in point would be the car crash, right? Because I was the I was kind of the victim, but then the other guy would say that he's he was the victim as well. So if you hear from his side of the story. That would be totally different, although it's still the same story, right? So it's uh, different interpretations. Um, yeah, what else should I? Yeah, let's just go in. Let's just uh, get into it, like like I'm a YouTuber or something. Let's get into it, um, right? So this is something I I I, I wrote uh, just early this morning because, like I said, we we haven't. Uh, we haven't finished, we haven't finalized the syllabus. I, I quite cheekily called it version 0.9 because it kind of is version 0.9 because it's still very changeable. Um, the version I sent to Abu Fazl, our, our uh, 
wonderful tutor sitting at the back there. That was version 0.8. So at least it's uh, it's 0.1 better than the one that I sent to him. Um, right. So this is what I wrote uh, early this morning, five, six o'clock ish. Um, so this is this is our course. It investigates uh, primarily Western because I don't know any uh, Eastern, quote unquote, Eastern critical concepts or theories that would uh, inform us the, the the study of narrative or uh, narratology. I forgot who t- who coined this this term narratology. It's one of these people in the in the reading list that uh, I think uh, after you finish the whole course, you would be able to remind me who came up with the term narratology. Um, so we ex- uh, will uh, examine some of the ways that these uh, lovely people try to theorize. Uh, interpret these uh, philosophical, ideological, um, structural, put things into structure, basically. Um, this is what people do when they make things into theories. They they find patterns to uh, the things that they observe. So a lot of these people that you will be reading uh, would be known as structuralists because they put things into structure. That's as simple as that. Um, so later on, I'll, I'll explain very briefly how the the story of narrative, right, the story of stories, uh, began. It it uh, many people would locate the beginning in uh, as early as Plato and Aristotle, the ancient Greeks. Um, so they started have this. They started having these uh, viewpoints on. What was art basically? That that's the that's a problem for for Plato, especially not not so much Aristotle, but for Plato, he he was he was trying to answer this question: What is art? But we could we could sort of just twist that into understanding. He's he's explaining what is narrative. I think it's roughly the same. Uh, a lot of people you'll be reading uh, in the coming thirteen weeks would have a similar uh, kind of way of looking at that anyway so i think it's a it's a right way to look at what what plato has said what aristotle has said uh, and then we move to uh i would call these modern but uh yeah we academics when we call something modern it's 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 actually positively old it's late 19th century early 20th century sort of thing that's that's modern anything past that would be postmodern, which is kind of the final stage of our understanding Incidentally, I am teaching a course called Postmodernism in the second semester, so we might we will be you know, diving very deep into postmodernism. Then we're not so much doing that here, but uh, there are some of the things that we will be talking about. It, it kind of touches upon postmodern takes of narrative, um, like for instance, you realize you 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 realize how I use the, the word rhetoric to explain narrative that's kind of postmodern you you sense a little bit of a political understanding of narrative how you know how government gives us you know a certain rhetoric to you know to buy into whatever even the whole covid situation that's that's pretty much a narrative right it's whether or not we still need to wear these things whether or not we still need these things I mean, they say it's scientifically proven, but then different countries have different ways of dealing with the problems, the different versions of the narrative, right? So everything is very political. Um, right, so at the end of this course, you'll be equipped, hopefully, I hope, you'll be equipped with a critical mind uh, to look at, look through, and look past narratives, right? When people tell you a, a, a story, when people tell you a narrative, you don't just believe in it hello you don't just believe in it uh uh at face value you would uh, be very critical you you will critique it you 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 be you you doubt is veracity you you test whether it's true uh whether it fits your narrative uh because narratives are everywhere kind of like that uh negotiator who who's selling his uh, lessons on masterclass on on you on the youtube adverts so According to him, negotiations are everywhere, but here narratives are everywhere. Um, I mean, if you think about it, negotiations are a kind of narrative, right? You have, uh, let's say you have a hostage situation. You have that that person demanding a plane, $1 million, whatever. I want to leave because my 
I don't know, my, my, my boss has mistreat, uh, mistreated me. So now I'm holding you know, 40 people in this room hostage, right? That's a story, right? You know, it has a background. He explains, he or she explains why they're doing it, right? So that's a story. And then the negotiator comes in, uh, could be that guy on the, on the advert, could be some other people. Uh, they would be offering another uh, version of the same story. You know, they they could they could um, you know to appease that person, right? To to sort of calm down that that uh, that person holding these forty people hostage in in the room. Right? That's their job, right? That's their job as a negotiator. So he might explain, oh, your your, your boss has already considered your benefits, blah blah blah. You know, you should be more should consider from his point of view. He's not mistreating you. You shouldn't hold these people hostage that's that's a that's a crappy negotiation I'm, I'm not obviously i'm not a professional negotiator if i if i were to negotiate in that if that kind of situation all of you would be dead um but you, you get the idea right you know, negotiations can be narratives so we win right we are better than that guy on the on the youtube adverts always uh always irritating me always stopping me from watching the actual thing that i want to watch on youtube uh which is stupid anyway but uh, anyway uh so this is what we're doing um the film what we might come to we might we might talk about the film a little bit later on if we have time which we we will because it's the first session usually the first session is very chill we just explain and you know, talk about the the syllabus go through the syllabus go through the assignments which i'm sure many of you are interested in uh let's look yeah let's talk about the assignments first right uh it's again this is just something that i just <laughs> that i just that thought up in like early this morning and half asleep half awake but i think it's it's fine you know we, we could always negotiate again we can always we can always negotiate some other types of uh assignments if you don't like these but you know this is pretty standard affair. You have a midterm paper, you have a final paper. Um, the midterm paper. I set the due date pretty late, right? Usually people set the the deadline at around reading week. But the way I set up this uh, the the lecture schedule. Um, for those of for those of you who, who can already see it, there is a pattern here in the, in the topics. The earlier topics are mostly on the basics, uh, on the theories and concepts, basic theories and concepts about how to study narrative, and then the sort of the second half of the or the final third of the course. It's it's more on the application of of how these concepts can be applied to a specific. Uh, case studies right for instance here's psychoanalysis uh here's here's disney here's uh the nature of history and uh and then this is something else so i thought it would be a good idea to put the 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 first assignment um sort of at that dividing line right the after you finish learning all the basic theories and concepts and then you do the midterm paper and then you have lessons on uh you know you look at how you know the applications of these you know, critical theories and concepts and then you write the final paper right that's that's kind of great but um i'm a little bit concerned about the time because marking your papers can be very time consuming so uh yeah i don't know but this is this is kind of uh the the dates that I'm I'm set on, 26th of October. I know it's a bit late, but yeah, I know you guys would like it. Uh, 1, 1,500 words, very short. Uh, analyze a story, any type of story it could be. It could come from a film, come from a novel, come from a, a, a you know musical theater, whatever. Could be a painting. If you can interpret the painting as a narrative, that's fine. Uh, use any of the theories or concepts that we've talked about or other concepts that you found in your research I, I don't I don't really mind you don't have to use the things that we talk about in the in the course you can use your own method but uh, you know sort of more critically sort of rigorously we always use that word rig rigor you know, academic rigor uh, rigor rigorously 
analyze the the story so you write that paper um yeah so paper like this would consist of two parts uh is it too large is it too small uh two parts uh one is the exposition of the story the the plot exposition and then the app the meat of the thing would be the application of the of the you know the actual analysis right that's the meat of the thing but you don't want to forget about the first half because a lot of people a lot of students when they write the textual analysis you know analyzing a film or whatever they they always have this accidental tendency to to assume that the the reader i.e the the marker has already seen whatever film they're analyzing which could be true but it's it's irrelevant because if you if you ignore if you skip uh things that you know your reader knows then th there's no point in writing anything right it's it's your job as a writer to provide the the context right and always assume your reader hasn't seen that film or hasn't read that book that's always a better approach right it, it makes your it makes your essay more complete right it, it's it's structurally more sound provides more context and anybody could just pick up your essay and, and read it and learn something right that's kind of ultimately what your essay is what your writing is about you you're teaching someone else about something that you found right the analysis where right? the meat of the thing the analysis is something you found you you read a story you found something and you know you you, you think it would be a good idea to, to use uh, some critical concepts theories to explain that you know that very precious thing that you found so basically you're teaching uh other people who haven't found this thing that you found that's that's the function of a piece of writing so yeah <sighs> i need uh i need some sleep but uh yeah maybe uh 90 minutes from now yeah um and then the final paper you could do the same thing uh same thing in the sense that you could work on the same paper this is what a lot of academics would do as well they write a shorter paper on a on a topic and then they found more stuff they they, they do their research they found more stuff to to add on to their original paper so they make the original paper longer so you could do that you can expand your uh your your midterm paper right that's one b one a would be to do it afresh you can start afresh you could you find a, a new story to analyze and this time you could present it in the traditional written form where did i where did i put it yeah traditional written paper or uh wait well why is why is the cursor not working anyway uh actually the, you can do uh you can do this because i tested this equipment last friday and i found this very wonderful uh you could do that wait that's not oh i've covered it <laughs> i wanted to i want to make it like a highlighter but uh yeah yeah you know you know what i'm trying to do um yeah so it's a it's a touch screen it's wonderful all the all the technology um anyway so instead of a traditional written paper you could do it in any other form you like if you want to do it in a in a uh, um what do you call it um like a performance art piece you know like a dance or whatever it's fine uh video essay would be more conventional um in the less conventional methods more conventional in the less conventional so you could do whatever format you want um the equivalent would be 2500 to 3500 words um what is the second thing i forgot ah right this <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. You could you could tell I just I just sort of came up with these things just off the top of my head. But I think it's wonderful. You could write your own story, right? You could you could use your creativity. You can write your own story in such a way that it's it's conducive to the kind of analysis that we will be doing in this course. So it's kind of um. I wouldn't want you to reverse engineer your stories because that wouldn't that wouldn't feel like it's beneficial to your creativity but if, if i mean if it if it's what you want to do then it's fine i guess um but um 
yeah, like for instance, J.K. Rowling wouldn't have written Harry Potter with with you know all those analysis and all those you know all those critics praise in mind when she wrote that story. When she wrote that story because she wanted to write that story. Right? So, um, so this might be a bad assignment the, the way I set it, but yeah, don't worry. If if you are the creative type, you I I don't mind. I don't mind reading stories. Um, yeah, but a short uh, explanatory note would be: uh, you'll be the judge. You, if you, if you think it doesn't need the explanatory note, you don't have to do it. But if you think it's too obscure, right? You, I'm too stupid to see. You know what sort of hidden meaning or whatever is hidden in your story. Then you, yeah, it's it's probably a a, a good idea to include an explanatory note. Uh, in your story so that's basically your ah yeah and you can do it in groups you can do it uh you know in pairs if you have a friend in the class whatever um if you want to do it together then that's fine as well i suppose you can do the video essay thing like the creative project sort of thing together as a group if you prefer then that that's that's also fine it's all very flexible i don't really I don't really mind uh, clear all the drawings. Right, so that's the assignments. Uh, I've prepared a little bit of like thing that I want to sort of introduce, um, you know, as a kind of introductory class, although I, it's it's kind of encroaching on what we will be talking in the in the second week, which will be the third week, because there is no second week. Um, the scroll wheel is is broken. Right, because the second week is uh, a holiday, so we won't be meeting you know each other. Next week will be uh, the class. The class will resume in the third week, so I'm sort of encroaching on a little bit on on what we will be talking about on the third week. But it doesn't matter. I think it's 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 interesting. Some of this is interesting. Uh, I put show don't tell. Now this is something that I always hear people say. What a good film would do, right? Uh, because a film is primarily a visual medium. So if you want to uh, express a certain plot point, uh, you know, a certain message, it's better for you to show it than to have a character say it out loud, right? This is what we think of this. Although sometimes the, it's not a, it's not a rule, right? Sometimes it could be broken. The, the example that I've, that I've, oh, bless you. The example that I, oh, bless you again. The example that I've, <laughs> bless you three times. Um, the example that I've uh, always gone to is uh, Life of Pi, which incidentally is a is an adaptation of a of a novel, right? But the film I'm talking about the film. If you remember, for those of you who have seen it, the 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 towards the end of it, the the main character is just describing the alternative version of what happened on the boat, right? You know, people attacking each other, you know whatever uh you might say that's the real version you might say that's that's not the real version but whatever but the way the film tells you that it, it tells you that it doesn't show you anything right? it doesn't show you you know the people fighting on the boat or whatever you just look at that main character it was it was Dev patel was it uh, doesn't matter so the main character just speaking right? the main character talking the story out loud but in this particular instance it's it's sort it sort of has that effect right it's it's sort of it's the effect that the film is going for right it, it's it's relying on our imagination to think what really went down on that boat right instead of that you know magical tiger or was it a tiger I don't know. magical tiger magical creatures or whatever you know that's the bit that 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 they show you right they don't you, we, they don't require your imagination to, to see it because they, the film actually shows you that part but then the the other version the the film chooses to tell you that in uh, because you need your own imagination to think that up and that's the sort of effect that is going for so it's not always a rule that 
uh show don't tell is a is a mark of a good film but uh here we're not talking about film although i am a film studies person which kind of shows because if you look at if you look through the uh syllabus i know the course title is uh what is it called i know it's very convoluted uh comparative studies of literary and visual narratives there's not a whole lot of literary here if, if i'm being brutally honest but yeah i mean i try to include some uh us uh don't worry we have uh abu fazl to the rescue because he will be giving a a, a, a guest lecture in one of the one of the weeks i put it i put tbd there so he's more of a literary type he's more literary than than i am i'm i'm more of a film so these person which reminds me because this is i mean we we are in comparative literature right the department we are in, in is comparative literature is not english lit is not uh you know it's not any kind of literature there is a there is a comparative in front of the literature so we're not looking at literature just at you know squarely as literature we we, we are adapting the cons the, the the idea of literature and film is kind of a you know the the best example of that right one of the ways is uh you know ad adapting literary works into into the visual format you know that's that's kind of your very classic uh way of explaining what comparative literature is it's very funny because every time there's a every time every year the uh, during the open day then people will come up to you come up to your booth and ask what what the hell is comparative literature I, I would never be able to answer it at all. My my sort of cryptic answer would be it's neither comparative nor literature. You know, to kind of keep things, you know, attractively uh mysterious, or or so I hope. I, I don't know. But it is kind of both, right? We are comparing the two. We and it is kind of literature. So I I don't know. I mean the things we are reading, they are they are words, right? They are literature. So we are still doing reading. So I don't know. Um, what else am I? What else? The uh, the computer, the fans, the fans on full tilt. Are you, are you okay? Um. So, like I said, it's it, you know, the story, right? The story of narrative began in uh, in the times of the ancient Greeks, in as far as Plato and Aristotle. So, Plato, when when he, uh. So he has he has this view on art. He basically he, he he thought art was useless because art there's no function to art, right? There's a I think this is a quote I I got from the Susan Sontag reading. Even the best painting of a bed would would just be well. I mean, the painting of a bed would be a painting. Right? It's not a bed. You can't you can't sleep on that thing. So it's useless, right? A painting of a bed is useless. An actual bed would be useful. So it's an is an imitation, right? A painting of a bed is an imitation. So art as my my mises means, you know, mi uh, yeah, imitation or uh, copying or whatever. Um, I think even in the in the Sontag reading, she kind of she kind of discusses this a little bit how the mimetic uh, tradition uh mimetic narration is is one of the ways to to do to do narrative uh other people you'll be reading uh that's uh for instance roland bart uh uh one of my heroes here david bordwell definitely would talk about the mimetic narration as opposed to the diegetic narration so aristotle was big on diegesis uh so so according to aristotle a, a narrative is a is a work with a with a plot a plot or or in his words mythos uh yeah i probably should use the the high-tech version again i guess wait uh, i don't i don't want that Right, so he's talking more about the you know narrative, right? You know, the, the stories, right? That's a story needs a plot to be a story, and it needs a narrator, right? A narrator has to be there to tell the story. 
Right. So diegetic, another another way to understand diegetic would be it, it's about the it's more about the language, right? Mimesis would be it's more about the the things you can see, right? Um I got this quote from uh, from the Boardwell uh, book. Um, the poet himself is the speaker. That's one way of doing narration. Um, kind of like what I just did, right? You know, when I was explaining uh, the 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 origin of my name or or how I got the hat, you know, the car crash or whatever. I was the narrator. I wasn't I wasn't somebody else. I wasn't pretending to be somebody else. That's the second way of telling the story right the, the narrator or here he uses the word poet because you know let's face it they are they are ancient greeks you know they're all poets um i suppose if you explain it in the 21st century it will be youtubers or you know bloggers or whatever influencers it's, it's the same basic principle anyway the person who's doing the talking right you know he he or she could be pretending to be um the other person I forgot. Did I did I do that when I explained uh, the car crash? Like the other guy, the other guy who hit me. You know, he could he could be the victim, but I didn't actually. I did. I didn't pretend to be him speaking as him. Right? You 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 know what I you know what I mean? Right? When you tell a story, you could pretend to be that person. And oh, I actually did. You remember I explained the the negotiator advert? Right? I pretended to be the negotiator. You get coffees in Starbucks. I don't know. How, I don't know why he put so much emphasis on the star in in Starbucks. Uh, getting coffees at Starbucks. And you are probably three to seven negotiations uh, each day. Crossing the road is a negotiation. So I'm pretending to be him. Right? So that's another way of. Um, telling the story but whichever way it is it's still you know i'm copying him i'm pretending to be him so that's my mesis that's that's sort of plato's way of understanding uh story uh whereas aristotle prefers the diegetic way which is um more on the plot more on the language but if you if you think about it they are actually talking about two different things right when when Plato was talking about these things, he's he's talking about narrator, right? He's talking about the 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 way the story is told, right? But when when Aristotle was saying that a, a story needs a plot, a uh, narrative is is a work with the plot. He's more concerned with the story itself, right, rather than the way the story is told. So I I don't know. This is just me. I, when I look at this. They are talking about different things. So instead of show, don't tell, I think it's show and tell, right? You need you need two different things. Sometimes you need uh, you need to show, sometimes you need to tell. Uh case in point would be the the life of pie example that I just I just used because that film very perfectly illustrates how two different ways to tell stories. I mean, you, uh, sometimes you show things, sometimes you tell things. Uh, debates on realism. I don't know why I put that there, but it's it's sort of related because, um, like for instance, if you if you if you take on the mimetic way of narration, obviously the the more the more real you are, the more real I sound like that negotiator person, the more immersive you will be, right? You 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 feel like you are actually you know hearing that person speaking, so it achieves that kind of effect. Um. I'm gonna skip this because I'm not really that that uh, clued up about like literary history. This is this is mostly literary history, which I'm not really that familiar with. Uh, Henry James, again, a, an author. Uh, he's, uh, I think, in some of these readings, you will you will see his name come up pretty often because he's sort of um, considered as the turning point of how you know how stories should be presented or how stories should be written um you know depending whether you want to rely on realism or not or you want the mimetic uh the mimetic tradition or the diegetic tradition um so he says uh here i'm, I'm also quoting from one from uh, from another book uh, rather than being simply told we are shown action and character as they develop through significant scenes using third person narration instead of first person narratives right so henry james's books i don't know i haven't read any of them but uh because oh that's another thing you should you probably should know about me when i introduce myself to people 
especially academics. I don't know why I always like to talk down myself. Like, you know, of course, I have to explain the Star Wars thing. And then the next thing I would explain is uh, I am an illiterate. I can't read. Right? Not literally, obviously, but um, not literally. But, you know, I, that's pretty, that, that was pretty much the reason why I got into film in the first place. Right? You know, because you don't have to read when you watch the film. You just you just watch it. Right. Uh, a film is more of a mimetic narration because it, it shows you things it doesn't it doesn't tell you things you don't have to read so much uh although if it's a foreign film then you have to read the subtitles and uh, i don't know that's another that's another matter um i had a i had an old teacher of mine when i was when i was doing uh my masters uh she was obviously she was way more literary than myself but she 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 explained why she got into film uh so she thought you know film only had a history of 100 years or so so she thought film would be an easy subject to get into instead of like literature or whatever you know you have to read as far as plato or, or maybe even beyond so you have a few a few thousand years worth of things you have to study whereas in film you only have to study 100 at her time, it was 100 years, but right now is what? Uh, I can't do maths. 125 years of worth of things. It's still a relatively short period of time. But, so that was her That was her logic. But obviously, she, she realized her mistake because it, the length of the time doesn't, doesn't, really, doesn't really matter. It's still, you know, it's still very complicated. There's still a lot of stuff to, to, to study. But I don't know. As a as an illiterate, uh, I would I would say film is a lot easier to study than than literature. But any, anyway, that's that's uh, that's another that's for another time. Uh, to Henry James's novels, I am told because I haven't read it, I haven't read any of any of them. But I am told he prefers the third person narration, right, up, 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 instead of the first person. Uh, way of, of of telling stories so again it's it's pretty much two different ways to talk about the same thing right it's not like one is better than the other right you could you could write your story in the in the third person perspective you could write a story in the first person perspective um you know they have their own advantages and disadvantages obviously if you write it in the first person perspective all the things that the character or all the things that the narrator knows would be that uh you know would be limited that to to that person's knowledge right whereas if you write it in a third person you can have a you can have an all-knowing uh omniscient uh you know god-like presence in the in the narrator the narrator knows everything right you i can't think of an example off the top of my head but you know what i'm you know what i mean right when when you have an when you have a narrator narrating a story the narrator isn't part of that story right? the narrator is outside of the story but the narrator knows what every character is thinking what every character is is feeling so you know the narrator has the has that advantage has that god like uh perspective Right, so that's one of the advantages, but then you're removed, right? You're removed from the story because you don't, you don't really feel, you don't really identify with any of the, with any of the characters. So that's just different ways of writing. Just as Aristotle argued uh, that an action or praxis had to be treated artistically before it became plot or mythos, James uh, distinguishes between the subject and the wrought material. Or novel thus prefiguring Russian formalists, which brings us to the uh, the next slide, which is uh, the most important thing I would say when uh, in uh, in narrative studies. So next week, well, not next, the week after next, we'll uh, we'll look at uh, a, a group of people known as the Russian formalists. Obviously, they were, they were all Russians. Otherwise, we wouldn't we wouldn't call them Russian formalists. I believe they want they weren't that keen on being called formalists as such, but uh, that's that's just a name. Uh, doesn't matter. So that so these uh, Russian uh, literary scholars in the late nineteenth, early twentieth century. Um, so they they studied the structures of stories. 
uh, or whatever. And the and these two words are the words that I I believe these are Russian. Any, anybody speak Russian here? I don't know, but this is the this is the Russian term for these two. Uh, concepts that we should really distinguish. I probably should have asked you this before we, we started everything. When I asked you what is narrative, right? Some of you, some of you said story, but actually, story and narrative they are two very different things because one is fabula, one is sujet. Um, um, anybody would hazard a guess why story and something else that's similar to story could be different. Right? Why is narrative and story different? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Doesn't matter. Oh, great. Yeah. Sure. Exactly. So yeah, it's the same story, but it can be told in different ways. How do you add a text box? I I don't really I don't know how to work. Um, I was trying to do copy a simple copy and paste. I I didn't I couldn't even do that because I don't know the I don't know the hot key for this. Um, yeah. I I now now I look like an idiot. Oh, there you go. Text box. Wait, is that the one? Yeah. Right. So uh, wait. What did you say? Discourse. All right. So the discourse and. Actually, some people, when they don't like using the, the, the Russian terms, they would use uh, other pairings such as this. Uh, so the discourse meaning words, basically how you use the language, and then the story is the story. So the story would be, um, let's use what, you know, one, of my, one of my examples, like the car crash thing. The story would be, I had the car crash and, you know, I hurt my head. I was, I was knocked out unconscious, whatever. So that's, that's the, the content of the, of the events. Right. But the way you tell the way I told the story, right. I could have, I, I could missed out some key elements. I could put things into different uh, uh, temporal order. I could start with, I, I uh, I woke up in the hospital, right? But it, chronologically, I crashed the car first before I went to the hospital to wake up there, right? But then when I when I tell you the story, I could start from I woke up in the hospital, and then I I remembered I was in the I was driving uh, a few hours ago and a few hours previously in the night I I I was hit by someone and. Uh, Right, so different chronology, you know, different ways you can tell the story. So this, so there are slight differences between the two. Sujet is the way you tell the story, whereas fabula is the story, right? Um, it's not really that different. It's not really that complex, but it's 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 there. It's very complete, right? You know, everybody can do. This is this is the the one of the um um. One of the nice things about our discipline, but also one of the one of the bad things, like for instance, film studies is is very much very serious in that problem because everyone can be a film critic. Everyone thinks they are a film critic, right? Because you you have eyes, you have ears, you have you have seen a film, you you have your own feelings about a certain film, then or you can you can have your own opinion, and then you know quickly you become a film critic. But um. I don't really have a bar because um, <laughs> your opinion is your opinion, right? It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't make, it doesn't make it wrong or whatever. But uh, um, I don't know. This is for another time. Because in the in the other course that I'll be doing, you know, in the postmodernism course, this is one of my aphorism. I suppose there is no right or wrong way to understand anything. So this is, you know, all these complete things is is very classic examples of that right there's no there's no right way or wrong way to look at a, a thing so your opinion could be as good as a an actual film critic's opinion so 
but you see you see the difficulty in our in our discipline right in 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 like scientific in like science subjects if you can't do rocket science then you can't do rocket science right you have to learn how to make a rocket in order to build a rocket but you don't have to learn film studies and you can still appreciate films you can still appreciate literature or whatever right but 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 in order to really appreciate these things you have to learn about these things um so this is one of those things i mean it's it's very simple once you explain it right the way you tell a story and the story itself you know it's very similar but then it, it's ever so slightly different but once you oh my god i'm out of my breath again uh once you um understand us the the differences you 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 kind of you 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 can you can't go uh you know what's the big deal right which can be true i mean it's, there's there's no big deal there's no there's no real purpose in uh you know distinguishing the differences between between the two right but uh but here we are we, you know we have these you know different different ways to understand a narrative Right, so the narrative is the way you tell the story, and then yeah. So another pair of another pairing would be. Oh my god, I really, I really want to take off my my mask. Do you know what? There is a there is a guideline from like the 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 office or whatever saying that you can actually take off your mask. Not you guys, but for me, uh, the lecturer can take off the mask. But I I don't know. I I feel like some of you might might find might feel this is a bit icky so i don't i don't i don't want to i don't want to make anybody uncomfortable um how do you make the text box again i i need i need that text yeah there you go right uh wait what am i what did i want to type a uh, narrative right narrative is the way to it's the way the story is told and then the story right um you will come across these these uh, oh my god what happened? You will come across these different different uh, pairings uh, later on in in all these subsequent readings that you'll be uh, that we'll be reading together. So don't worry if you don't worry if you don't know which is which, or don't worry if I have mixed up some of them, which I might have done. I might have mixed up uh, discourse and story and narrative and story. I, I I don't know, but the the meaning is there. Which is why I like Sujay and Fabula because nobody, nobody mixed up, nobody mixes up Sujay and Fabula. We all know Sujay is the way the story is told, and Fabula is the chronological ordering of the events. Um. Anyway, what? Why am I? Why did I put this there? Um. Ah, right. So when you write a story, uh, when you put things into narratives, um. There are two sides to this equation, right? You you can be the author writing the story. You could be the storyteller telling the story. But then there is another side of this equation of this of this formula, which is the the reader, the listener, you guys, right? And the relationship between the two. It's it's not that simple. Right? It's it's not. Um, there are many different layers to the author reader relation the author can imagine what the reader would think when the author writes the story right and that imagined reader would be different from the actual reader right um kind of like how this lecture is going probably i might i have a i you know I, it, it sound it sounds pretty good in my head but then may, maybe you maybe you, find, you you think that i'm just bumbling along no uh, you know just you know, mumbling some uh, incomprehensible stuff. So my expectation and your experience might be different. So there are already two different versions of the of the reader there, right? Author, similarly, you have you have two different, at least two different versions of the author, right? The reader could imagine how the author thinks, right? And that would be different from the actual author. I forgot where I got this sort of meme like joke from. It's most likely from one of those like YouTube videos that I always watch. But um, um, 
you know how when you know lit- literature teachers when they teach uh, uh, a work uh, like a book or whatever when the when the when the author writes um, let's think of a think of an example the table is made of wood right let's say the table is made of wood and the teacher would go and give you like hours and hours on end of interpretation of why the author is describing this table is made of wood is because of is it you know it's it's the author's way of um criticizing patriarchy or you know there's um uh, uh, uh you know his disdain towards uh, you know capitalist society or maybe he has you know he's not he's dissatisfied with his uh, you know way of living or whatever right you know a literary teacher would would say can can give you all those interpretations whereas the actual author would tell you i i wrote the table was made of wood because the table was made of wood that's it right so um so that's kind of that that resonates with what uh maybe not so much bart but definitely uh, susan sontag's against interpretation that's kind of the 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 main takeaway of of what what she means by against interpretation you could do all these kind of interpretations in cultural studies or whatever but the you know the the truth is sometimes you may there, there may not be a hidden message right there may not be an interpretation that the, the table is made of wood because it is made of wood there's there's no you know there's no hidden meaning it's it's not the author's way of of um you know trying to rebel against capitalism or or whatever um the death of the author I, i'm i'm sure you all know you all know the uh, and vast death of the author weirdly i can't find this i can't find this article it's not in any of the books it's not in susan sontag's uh, books she has she has a book uh on roland bard which has all these collections of uh, of essays that bard has written but none of those were none of those was death of the author but anyway it, it's it's so well known you don't you don't really you don't really have to read it but it's basically the the meaning once the Oh, but that's the reverse, right? That's the opposite of what I just said, right? Once the story has left the author, the meaning is not controlled by the author anymore because the reader reads it and the reader interprets it and and it's become it's become the reader's thing, right? So the reader could be like, you know, the table is made of wood because, you know, he's really unhappy about capitalism. That could be the that could be the meaning. Uh Bart also wrote this uh, other essay called Third Meaning. Um, I'm sorry I didn't include this on, but it, I think it's easy to find. So the first meaning would be the table is made of wood. That's the first meaning. The second meaning is the table is made of wood because it represents capitalism, it represents patriarchy, it represents, uh, you know, uh, anti-colonialism or, you know, whatever, you know, all those lovely big words big isms that you can think of right that's the second meaning the third meaning is i don't know whether i've um interpreted it wrong but my interpretation <laughs> talking about against interpretation here i'm I'm interpreting uh roland bart's writing but i, I hope my interpretation is quote-unquote right but but then again there's no right or wrong in cultural studies or it's all very complicated but anyway my understanding of the third meaning is an accidental meaning right i can't think of a i can't think of an example to explain this the the, the table is made of wood um the accidental nature of it is that the author didn't intend it obviously so none of those capitalism you know uh, anti-colonialism tendencies or whatever obviously none of those things but there is something that's obvious, like the wood, right? The nature of the wood that the the author has mentioned, but the author didn't intend it there. That would that would be that would be what he means by third meaning, right? It's similar to, um, uh, or as I understand it, it's similar to Roland Barthes. Uh, I don't know whether you um, you you've heard of this. Uh, concept before it's the uh punctum and the stu- and the studium again i need a text box here or i can just write it down actually let me just write it down hey oh it's not a very good touch screen 
Uh, wait, how do you spell punctum? Ah, is it one U or two U? Doesn't matter. Uh, studium. Studium. It could be two U's. It could be I don't. I don't doesn't matter. So Roland Barthes was writing about photography here, and uh, that so he he describes the the punctum of the of the photograph and the studium of the photograph. The studium would be the things that you could see. In it's sort of like th this pairing, right? It's sort of like the the sujet and the and the fabula, if you if you think about it. Um, the studium is the the things that you could see in the photograph like it, let's say it's a photograph of, of three people you know standing together you know taking a taking a picture so the three people would be the would be the studium right the actual intended subjects of the photograph the punctum is what he's interested in is what makes photography so i don't know so it's magically wonderful for I, I'm, I'm sure for a lot of you um is the accidental nature of the photography right when you press that shutter in that moment in time it freezes that time and there's there's something in the photograph that the 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 photographer didn't intend to record but then it, it got recorded anyway right so that's the accidental let, let's say the, the there are trees in the background of the three people right in that photograph and the trees were you know all the leaves were blowing right in that in that moment and the leaves were, were blown in such a way that it's it looks beautiful right that would be the punctum of the photograph, right? Because the, the photographer taking that photograph didn't intend to record that moment of the of the leaves blowing in the background, right? But then it it's it's there in the photograph and it's beautiful, right? It's it's what makes that photograph beautiful. So that's that's the punctum. So that that for me is what he means by oh my god, I'm losing, I'm losing my breath. Uh what he means by third meaning. I mean, you could understand, you could see how it 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 happens in photography, right? Because but you, you don't you don't get to control all the things, right? When you when you take when you press the shutter, you don't you don't get to control everything. But when it, when it comes to writing a story, you would think that because every single word comes from comes from the author, this sort of accidental meaning wouldn't wouldn't appear, but uh, but 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 they still do, right? So. Yeah, so we'll be looking at those, hopefully, I think. I'm not really sure if, if this would come up, but yeah, just keep that in mind, right? When you when you read something, obviously there is that against interpretation tendency, you know, when the author says it the table is made of wood, don't don't overanalyze it and, and say that, oh, the wood represents uh, you know, the the exploitation of the workers, right? Because wood is such an honest uh you know, material, it's simple, it's utilitarian so it represents the workers or whatever you know i i i, I could i could i could go on forever i i, I could give you you know a, a fantastic or you know pseudo cultural studies like explanation of just a wooden table this is what we do as uh, as uh, cultural studies scholars or whatever uh, we basically make up stuff but uh, but there's a fine line between making up stuff and and, and uh, actually saying legitimate things so that's that's pretty much what that is. Um, so finally, uh, this is what we might talk, we will talk about in the third week. Um, again, this is um, it's a bit embarrassing because, like I said in the in the message that I sent through Moodle, is there something wrong with this mouse? Because I honestly, I positively can't breathe. <sighs> um, so in the message, I said uh, I still needed time to test out the. The readings because um um because i designed the whole thing from the ground up which is stupid absolutely stupid when people are assigned to teach this is not my course right i don't i don't know i don't know how like a proper assistant professor would do these sort of things but when they are assigned when they are tasked to to teach a course they would have uh uh an already centrally approved syllabus or whatever and they can just teach that thing they don't have to do anything they just have to read the materials whatever i don't i didn't get that version of the syllabus nor do i want to get that version because i don't really feel very comfortable to talk talking about other people's stuff although this isn't my material per se so i don't know what i'm talking about here but i, I just designed the whole thing from the ground up and i needed to test 
absolutely every single reading to see whether they work, whether they whether they make sense. Obviously, I you know me being the lazy ass that I am, I haven't got enough time to read everything. I don't know. I don't even know if this uh, Todorov reading is about this thing that everybody knows. Honestly, who who already knows about this? The equilibrium. I'm sure there must be one or two of you in here who, who knows about this because this is so famous. It's, it's so famous. It's like one of those um like film studies things if you are interested in films enough you will you will you know you are bound to know some film theory before you even go to film school or go to university to study film or whatever but, um and it's it's so fantastic one of those uh one of those theories that once you know it is so fantastic you can't forget it you can't unsee it um it's kind of like in in film you have the the shot reverse shot editing technique anybody know the shot reverse shot anything once you know it you can't unsee it because every time you see a, a tv program you see a film you, you know, all you can see is shot reverse shot so this is similar to me um everybody knows it the equilibrium um theory i'm not even sure if Todorov calls it that but uh it is it, it has become like this right our our, our study our our discipline of cultural studies you can like i'm i'm one of those people as well i would i would do my learning not from reading actual books or whatever i would actually go to youtube and see other people you know make their own you know, stupid videos or whatever and i would read wikipedia pages this is the 21st century uh, 21st century way of learning um so this is one of those you might you, you might find it easier to learn about these things from from those uh less reliable sources than actually reading these i'm not even sure if this total of reading like i said i'm not even sure if this is the reading that talks about this i will have to test this out i have to actually read it word by word uh later maybe not this afternoon because i haven't i haven't slept at all I, you know after after this is done I, I'll, I'll just go home and sleep um anyway whether or not this is whether or not this is uh well whether or not this is about that it doesn't matter i know for a fact that this person comes up with this because enough people have talked about this and it, it's like the shot reverse shot uh editing technique in film once you know about it you can't unsee it you can't unknow it it's 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 stuck in your head um so i just thought it, it's a it's a it's a sort of a, an attractive thing that sort of peaks or interest, I suppose, you know, in studying narrative, there is this wonderful theory out there that you, you probably didn't know before, but then once you know it, you can't unsee it. Right. So equilibrium, um, basically it's, it's, it's sort of an ABA situation. It's kind of like a song. You have a, you have, you, you have the initial state, and then you come back to this initial state, although it could be it could be slightly um, varied. And then there's this there is this middle bit in the middle. I can give an example. Um, Spider Man would be an example. I'm not talking about the um, the newer ones. The Spider Man that I know is uh, Tobey Maguire. I'm I'm that generation, and I don't know I don't know about the other two. On honestly. I haven't seen any of the of the other films. I've only seen the Tobey Maguire films. Well. I, I suppose the story itself would be the same, right? You're talking about uh, Sujay and Fabula. The story, the Fabula of the Fabula of of Spider Man would stay the same, although the Sujay, the way they you know they use different actors, they use different I don't know story elements, but it's still Spider Man. Anyway. Right, Spider Man. There's uh, Peter Parker. A, I think he's a college student, like like yourselves. Um, you know, kind of dorky, whatever, has a friend, Mary Jane. Although I think the I think the Andrew Garfield version is not Mary Jane, but somebody else, but it doesn't matter. I, I'm not I'm not a I'm not a Marvel nut to whatever to, to know about these 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 uh, small details, but go you know, go along with me. Um you know, he has a friend, Mary Jane, uh, you know, studying college, whatever, you know, just a normal kid. Uh he has an uncle. However, you know, the, everything is peaceful, you know, fine and dandy, nothing special happens. And then, uh, and then uh, something disrupts this equilibrium 
And those things include being uh, bitten by the spider. That's one thing. The uncle being killed is that other thing, right? Because in the equilibrium, when everything was peaceful and fine and dandy, the, 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 the uncle is still living, right? The, the, the uncle is living and fine and, you know, you know, uh, you know, talking with him, having dinner, whatever, you're having nice time generally, but then he's killed. So this equilibrium is, is disrupted, right? And at the same time, he gains these special, you know, spidery superpowers, whatever, to, to aid him to bring everything back to uh, what it was before, when everything was still peaceful and, you know, everybody's singing and dancing and, uh, yeah. So the equilibrium is restored. So the, so Spider-Man does his own, does his Spider-Man things, defeat the, the bad guys, whatever, and restores the equilibrium. But this is a new one because now Mary Jane is, uh, you know, his girlfriend instead of just a, just a friend, right? So something's improved, but the uncle is still gone. The uncle is still killed, but he kind of accepts it now. So the equilibrium is restored. Um, so this is the most classic way of a, of any story. You could think of any story you, you want, and, and I can guarantee you 99% of the time, maybe 100% of the time, you can, you can fit this uh, formula. There. There's an equilibrium. There's a problem that disrupts the equilibrium. And then what the main character does throughout that story is to find a way to restore that equilibrium again. Right? This incidentally was the reason why I didn't quite like um what's that what's that called? Um you know, that woman with the chess thing or the the Netflix series, um The Queen's Gambit, when people were when people were crazy about that that show, and I was like, there's no disequilibrium there in the story because everything was going very smoothly that was kind of how, that was kind of my take of that story um but like i said before right these are not rules where right? you don't these are not set in stone you don't have to follow them in order for the story to be good so you don't have to follow this right it's the the relationship is reverse it's it's not a story is good not because it follows the rule right these um these right, these thinkers, right? These 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 scholars, they they come up with these rules because they found this pattern, right? The pattern the pattern doesn't make the story, but the stories make the pattern. If that makes sense, right? The the cause and effect relationship is reverse, right? Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah, so that's 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 pretty much it. I I think. Yeah. So when I first knew about this, I I was. Uh, Obviously, I was ec I was ecstatic because it's it it's so it's so true. It's it, you know every everywhere you look, it it just follows its pattern, which is why it makes it so so powerful, right? It it almost feels like it is universally true, but uh, but like I said, you don't have to follow. It's it's not a rule that you have to follow. Right? A good story doesn't have to follow this. Uh, I'm trying to think of a. Yeah, I'm trying to think of an example of a of a good story that everybody knows that doesn't have a doesn't have a problem. Yeah, that's the thing. I can't really think of anything. But uh yeah, maybe that's your task, right? You can think of a, a good story. Everybody claims that that's a good story, but it doesn't have a problem in the middle. Yeah, like take Spider-Man as an example, right? The, the spider story, the version of the Spider-Man story that doesn't follow this pattern would be uh, the uncle isn't marked, right? The uncle just walks down the street, you know, very uneventful. He he doesn't meet, he doesn't come across the the was was it, were those thieves trying to steal things from the uncle, whatever. Like like I said, I'm not really steeped into, I'm not steeped in Marvel folklore, whatever. But so the uncle was fine. There was no spider. Uh, there was no baddie, right? No, nothing. That would be equilibrium all the way, right? So, so Peter Parker goes to college and graduates. The end, right? That would be, that would be the alternative version of of, uh, of the non-Spider-Man, right? 
but that would be boring right so that's that's worth thinking about what makes a story worth uh worth reading or worth watching right it does it really need the the problem in the middle right does the uncle does the uncle have to die uh is it uh, does there have to be that you know genetically altered spider to make this a worthwhile story to read or watch anyway we are prescient or prescient i like to pronounce this word prescient this is from the film but uh since only four of you have seen the film maybe we won't talk about that film but it's it's an interesting film no uh primer there's a story again another story i like i like my anecdotes i you know people who know me know knows that i always just go off track and just tell my stories that may not be very relevant um this was the film that was shown to me when i was a first year um student at, at the university studying film at the at the orientation event right so we were we were all first year uh film studies students that was back in 2006 right so we so we were gathered around in that in that room we had uh we had drinks and some food or whatever and then we came we we came to this uh I can't remember whether it was a secret screening or whatever. It might have been. It might have been secret because I didn't know. I didn't know what we were watching at the time. Um, so that was that was the film that they show for the for the orientation for the for the film program. So this is this has that significance. Um, I probably wouldn't pick this if I was the if I were the 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 chair of that film of the film department. I would probably pick something that's less uh less obtuse less convoluted less difficult to understand this is a very difficult it is it is like it's deliberately difficult to understand which is why i said this as an introductory sort of you know wetting your appetite type uh viewing material because it you know it gets you think right as a as a storytelling exercise is it an is it a successful one or is it a or is it unsuccessful it, let me tell you, this film has a cult following. What you would call a cult following, a lot of people. I must. I'm probably not one of them, even though it's it's about time travel. So I am the time travel guy. It is about time travel. It's sort of right up my street, but I don't really like it precisely because it's just too obscure. It's sort of it's sort of deliberately not letting his viewers understand what the story is but then the more times you watch it the more you realize that the the filmmakers they probably didn't mean it that way but that's what they made in the end they, they made a they made a very obscure very difficult to understand text although their intention wasn't 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 like this but anyway um right so for the remaining time let me just uh talk you through the rest of the schedule just to give you a brief idea of what we'll be discussing uh in the next uh, 10 weeks or so right so formalists like i said russian formalists and structuralists this is the sort of the next step right since the plato the the aristotle the uh like henry james whatever uh you know since since the uh realization of these patterns and structures and theories and concepts that could be observed in the study of narrative so this is you, you could say this is the first time they they found these patterns these theories that could uh you know, generalize the the phenomenon of of storytelling of narrative studies or whatever so it's russian formalists uh Todorov isn't Todorov isn't one of the Russian formalists, although the name kind of kind of looks like a Russian name. I, I don't think he's he's not a Russian. He's a Bulgarian, I believe. A, kind of it's a Soviet, but not 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 Russian. Um, and uh, Roland Barth, uh, he wrote this introductory. Ah, this is also one of the difficulties for me to set this syllabus because it, it kind of has a circular nature of it because you know there are people who keep who, who would repeat certain ideas and I, there's no sort of linear logic to placing these 
uh, reading material. So you, so so there might be times you might come across some things that you don't understand in these readings, and the opposite might also happen. Right when you read these readings, and you you're like, oh, I I already know this, right? You know, some somebody else have or has already talked about this, so that might happen as well. So so that that's why because there's a there's a certain kind of circular nature in it so don't mind that because that that's kind of the nature of um narrative studies i suppose uh week four is on this little concept called focalization the in plain english focalization would be uh point of view i suppose yeah point of view of uh the, the, the how you tell a story so like in my example of the car crash, it could be from my own point of view, it could be from the other guy's point of view, it could be from the police's point of view. Hence, I didn't get any compensation because of their point of view, but it doesn't matter. You don't have to know about that. Um, yeah, so that's that's. That. I believe it's uh, Gerard Jeanette who came up with uh, the term, but... Um, but I didn't I didn't put Jeanette's reading as the primary reading. I I there are there are instances where I put the secondary reading on purpose, the because they're easier to read. Like uh, case in point would be the Paul Rico material. Paul Rico is just really hard to understand, really really dense to read, and uh, even I myself would cry because I am an illiterate, obviously. But uh, you know, even I myself would cry reading these you know difficult materials. I I, I set the secondary uh, you know texts on those just to make things easier. So Mika Bao would be the the secondary. So she didn't come up with focalization, but she uh, makes use of uh, Jeanette's ideas of focalization and, and explain what focalization is, how how it works in narrative studies. Um, oh, and the films. I, I've I've thought long and hard to put which films to put in the in the syllabus and i ended up having like some of the most classic like you know one of those like you have to watch these before you die type situation um citizen kane one of them uh i did do citizen kane in my own thesis you might you might you might be surprised to to learn because it's it's not about time travel there's no time travel there the citizen kane is not about time travel but i i, I sort of made it that way but i'm so, but, but but we're not reading that chapter that i did um Film narration, since I am a film person, so there is a very distinct slant towards the film, the, vis the uh, visual side of things. There's not a lot of literary in this course, but there's a lot of visual in here. But film narration is slightly different from, uh, you know, let's say a, a literary narration or, you know, theatre or drama or whatever, because because film has all the weapons right films can tell you stuff films can show you stuff films can have music which incidentally is what saved that film uh primer for me for me the music there was very um instrumental in gu in guiding the, the the audience for me at least for guiding the audience of, of of you know what stages of the story we are looking at because without the Without the sounds, without the music, that this film will be even more difficult to understand. That's 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 kind of how I read this. I wish I had the time to actually look at the film to, you know, to 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 analyze it with you. But uh, since only four of you have seen this film, that that might be pointless. Um, yeah. So we're looking at uh, narration in in film. Uh, Rear Window again, Alfred Hitchcock, obviously one of one of those like the films you have to watch before you die type situation um and the narrator uh, has anybody seen uh rashomon no oh you have yes so you, you you know why i put that there uh about narrator uh the rashomon effect for those who may not be uh familiar with with the term so different narrators um this uh this next week is the week that I'm really apprehensive about because uh like I said the poor equal material I I didn't I didn't read those I didn't read these materials when I was doing my own research even though it's it's on narrative it's on times it's 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 right up my my own research research street but I didn't read this because it was too difficult I just sort of 
ignore it but uh, uh, uh things happen they just they just sort of come back to haunt you so uh, i mean i could have just i could have just scrapped this week i might i might still scrap this week i don't know but i think it's a important kind of topic to understand like time the sense of time or the the, the way that time is thought about in telling stories uh and then I put Tarkovsky there. It's it's like a double whammy there because I, I don't I personally don't like Tarkovsky. I am a film person. So every, it's it's almost like for a legitimate film person, he or she has to like Tarkovsky's films, but I'm probably the exception. I don't know. I don't like Tarkovsky, but I just put I just put that there. Maybe I would change my mind after this week. I don't know, but it's it's uh, so I, this is the week that I'm really worried about. And then the next week is uh abel fazel's uh turn to do is uh he's still planning on things but uh uh i'm looking forward to listening to that um and then week 10 uh psychoanalysis so i i suppose most of you are complete majors here right but um the way I see, it, because I I also you know, aside from lecturing some courses in this department, I also TA a lot of other courses here. So I, I kind of have a sort of pretty wide understanding of how this department works in terms of its its, its courses and 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 reading or whatever. I don't really see a hell of, uh, a lot of psychoanalysis being talked about in the in the syllabus. So in other courses, I I don't know. I just I just think it's it's. I mean, on the one hand, it is sort of an outdated theory, but it's still it's still very important in understanding just about anything. Kind of like that total off uh, equivalent thing that I just showed you. It, it's so it it's so kind of you know it, it gives you that aha moment, like it, like it, everything fits, like everything works it's like, it like it's like everything you see would fit this 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 mode of this this concept this theory like freud psychoanalysis would be would be one of those and uh but the way we're looking at psychoanalysis is is kind of different uh for those who haven't studied psychoanalysis you, of course you already know that it's about you know sex or whatever but this is the sexless way of looking at psychoanalysis which is kind of um how should i put this because i that's my argument right the, the, my argument about um freud's material is that he he what he didn't really mean he didn't really mean it for all the all the readings of, of sex or whatever that was the accidental talking about the third meaning that's that's sort of the third meaning coming out of all the all the freud's uh you know research and work and i i my my attempt is to try to go back to the origin of um of psychoanalysis to look at it purely as a narrative right so uh, i'm sure most of you would know what psychoanalysis is is uh, another way to describe the to describe the psychoanalysis um session would be the talking cure right you have the patient you have the you have the doctor and then the patient would would, would, would tell things to the to the doctor and through that talking the the psychosis the mental problems in the in the patient would be cured that's based that's that's the basic premise of psychoanalysis so there's no sex involved right but it's it's just so happened that uh a lot of the traumas would involve sex right you know i was molested as a child blah 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 a lot of the a lot of the traumas would involve sex so it becomes it it, it, it evolves into a theory about sex but i my argument would be that psychoanalysis itself isn't about sex but it's about the storytelling side of it right the, the patient recounting uh his or her traumatic experience as a, as a child or whatever so, so we're kind of looking at that um has anybody seen the sixth sense because if you have seen it it would be kind of ruined but one two okay oh, yeah i think it's fine um I could set some other films, but I mean, for those of you who have seen it, it's it's fine. You you know, the surprise is ruined. Although now that I mentioned there is a surprise there, I I kind of ruined the surprise myself. But it doesn't matter. We are here to study the 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 phenomenon. We're not we're not we're not just you know 
ordinary film viewers just just watching for fun, right? watching for entertainment or whatever. So there's spoilers. The fact that there is spoilers, it's it's sort of related to narrative as well. It's sort of related to how I understand narrative because spoilers is something. Spoilers is the story element in the future that you're not supposed to know about in the present moment, right? So the the storytellers meant for you to discover a certain thing about the story way into the future, but instead you know about that way before. So the surprise is ruined. So the so the spoilers that kind of has a you know it's an interesting thing to think about in terms of studying narrative. Anyway, uh, right. The next week is uh, Disney adaptation. I could have, I could have said like you know Snow White or whatever you know like your very classic adaptation or, or ruination of of uh, the, you know Grimm's Brothers tales or whatever. That's sort of more classic way of looking at this problematic called adaptation in in the disney flavor right disney usually uh, destroys the original story and disneyfy the, the the stories but i just remembered i i saw this um uh documentary a while ago obviously because it was 2013 and i saw this documentary a while ago and i thought it might be a good a cool kind of focal point to look at this set of materials mary poppins is a classic uh disney film and then there's this other film talk about it's a, it's it's a very diff, it's a very um special type of adaptation it's not a straight adaptation right they're not there is another film uh, uh mary poppins returns or whatever that's that's more of a that's more of a classic way of adapting an old story although it's it's a continuation rather than just remaking this the same story but the the 2013 film saving mr banks it, it's 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 about the background like the context of how the mary poppins story was written or the mary poppins film was made so it's it's more about the the author whatever it's it's a different kind of adaptation and there's a, a bit of real life uh seeped into it so it's not it's it's a blurring between fiction and reality which brings us to the next uh topic which is history because history is reality right but then the way you write about history i mean even like the government's um rhetoric of how we fight covid or whatever it it sounds like it feels like it's it's fact based is science based or whatever but you have different versions right because different countries would have lifted off the, the the mask ban whereas in here we're still wearing our mask or whatever different ways to interpret science even science has different ways of interpretation and then the the final week this is a this is a bit of a uh well i say special but it's not really special on from your perspective because you, you you're looking at this from you're, you're looking at this for the first time but i I actually helped TA this course last year. So it was taught by another person. And he his design was completely different. I didn't, I didn't copy any of his uh, uh lecture plans except for this one. This week was completely his material. He he set the Stuart Hall, he's he set the the Eve Sedgwick reading. He also set this film. The reason why I kept this set of materials is because of the film the film is so interesting you know we always like to use this word interesting but we can't think of any anything that's of substance to say right but the film is interesting so i just thought we we should probably look at this together and uh, and conclude this in, in uh you know reading against the grain i even i even uh ripped off his 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 um lecture title but it, it kind of sums up what we are trying to do here. We, we're not just reading these narratives. We're reading against the, the surface level. Right? We are trying to read through these stories, read past these stories, because we are more critical. Right? We are more, we're more observant. Right? We, are, you know, we, 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 we think more. Right? So, so that's kind of a good way to summarize everything, I suppose. Right, so that's everything, I think. Why is it here? Yeah, so that's everything. So any questions? Yes.
you are going to have to talk to Abu Fazl. Usually we don't change the, the schedule because they are pretty much set. You might have to make a choice between this and the other course that it clashes with. I'm, I'm really sorry. I, I, I never had this problem when I was a student because it, I don't know. But then I didn't have the same privilege as, as you guys have because you guys can choose just absolutely anything. You could like go to, I don't know, can you go to like the medical school and take like medical lessons or whatever? But it, it seems like that way, right? But for me back then, when I enrolled in the, in the film studies and the music program, all I could choose was the film and the music courses. I couldn't choose anything else. But the advantage was that we we didn't get any time clashes or whatever because the system was sorted out for, for me. So yeah, so I didn't have that trouble. But then again, I I couldn't I didn't have the privilege of 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 the ability to choose any other like you know any other courses. So any other question? Maybe? If uh, not, then I guess I'll go home and sleep and I'll see, I'll see you guys in two weeks time. <laughs>